So here's how uh, economics generally uh, thinks about the world, the theory of value in economics. Okay. We have oranges. We have apples. There's a production function, okay, production possibilities frontier. There's a budget line. There's a budget line that just kisses right there, and there's a utility that just kisses right there. The slope of that budget line is uh, the ratio of the two prices, the price of oranges over the price of apples. Here you have quantity of oranges and quantity of apples. Okay, you can all draw that in your sleep. Okay. This is, this is standard uh, economics. Now, what I want to observe about this, first of all, is that this is a story about the determination of the relative price of apples and oranges okay, that doesn't seem to have any money in it at all. Okay? Um, and what we're determining, so that's one thing. There's no sort of quantity of money. It's as if these, these oranges and apples are sort of facing each other in a barter sort of relationship. Okay, we're abstracting from money. We're abstracting from the mechanism of money. That's one thing. The second thing is, look, the price that gets determined in this story is a relative price. It's the ratio of the price of or oranges and apples, and we don't know what the absolute price level is at all. Okay, the the P, P O could be ten. This could be twenty. This could be hundred. This could be two hundred, and it's all the same. Okay, there's no story in here about the absolute price level. So what have economists done? Okay, what they essentially do, and, and this connects up to what I was saying about the money view being at a sort of distance, okay? they sort of paste on a theory of money and the price level, and that's the quantity theory of money. So using, using the idea that, well, these transactions have to be made using money, so let's just say you know, MV equals POQO, Okay, plus P A Q A. Okay, so there's these, there's these transactions, nominal transactions that have to be made. Um, we can call that M V equals P Q. Okay, so this is our the quantity theory of determination of the price level. If we read this from left to right, or there were always people, more money view people, who said, well. Look, money in the real world is sort of endogenous. It's a form of credit, and so maybe we'll read this from the right to the left, okay, instead. Okay, so there are these transactions, and the question is how much money and how fast does it have to turn over in order to make all these transactions? And that was always, that's sort of banking school sort of point of view um, focused on that. But at any rate, monetary theory was done, ta but you're talking about in, in this sort of framework here. Um, the, the velocity equation, that we always had an uneasy relationship to the theory of value. It's kind of pasted on. It's, a, it's an accounting identity in some ways that then you try to turn into a theory, and, um, but it was the closest you came to science in this area. And this is the way things sort of proceeded for uh, centuries. Uh, the uh, one, one breakthrough started to happen in the 20th century. And it was Irving Fisher who said, well, that's all very fine and good, this picture here, but uh, what if we make it more, we can make it more interesting by treating this as consumption in time one and this consumption in time two, okay? In which case, our price ratio here is uh, the price of, uh, uh, the price of oranges, okay, which is the price of price of consumption, okay, over P two uh, over one plus R here, okay. So we're we're having a discount rate here, okay. and let's therefore think that we can expand the quantity equation here to be P Q, okay, plus uh, P F, say. Um, or rather, one over one plus r. Okay. So when Irving Fisher used the quantity equation, um, he used the so-called transactions version of it. Okay, which which pointed out. 
that a lot of things that people are buying with money, okay, are not goods, okay, they're bonds and stocks and other financial assets. And so he tried to use this sort of standard structure, but again, stick close to the quantity theory and say, well, if you have more money in the world, okay, if you read it from left to right, it's not just going to mess with the price level of commodities, it might also mess with the price level of financial assets. And, and so more money means higher prices, more money means lower interest rates. Okay? More money means lower interest rates. And it's, it's from this tradition, from Irving Fisher, that we got ISLM. Right? More money means lower interest rates. Right? Maybe I did that a little fast. Okay, more money, meaning shifting the LM curve to the right. This is, this, I'm not gonna teach you ISLM if you don't know it. Um, we haven't used it in this class, so don't worry about it, okay? But if you do know it, this is now connecting it, it up, okay? That it comes from, it's an attempt to, to just build that thing out a little bit, okay? Um, and make it, and make, and this became standard macroeconomics in the post-war, in the post-war uh, period where your, your story is that in the short run, okay, changes in money affect um, Q, okay, um, output, okay, and, and interest rates. In the long run, they affect only the price level. That's the story probably you learned in intermediate, in intermediate macro. But it has a history, and a history that, in, that, that is shaped by this uneasy relationship between the theory of value and the theory of money, an attempt to kind of smush them together um, and make them, make them, uh, make them, uh, if not completely consistent, um, at least make them talk to one another. And you can jazz this thing up. By the way, I'm making this two periods, but this could be n periods. This is intertemporal general equilibrium. Everything is perfectly general here. I'm just making it in intertemporal Arrow de Bruyne general equilibrium. Okay. The point is that this is a patch, okay? People, serious general equilibrium theorists, okay, Arrow and De Bruyne, um, and particularly Frank Hahn was the most, most vocal about this, um, said, well, the big problem with Arrow De Bruyne general equilibrium theory is that it has no place in it for money, okay? And they were not happy with this little paste thing here that Irving Fisher had done at the, at the beginning of the century, okay? They were not happy, but they couldn't figure out what else to do. Much of, you could write the story of the development of sort of mainstream uh, of, of monetary economics in the post-World War II period, okay, as an attempt to somehow squish money into this story in a more satisfactory way. And there are a couple of attempts, and there's search theory, and there's various things. Uh, but uh, when I was starting, I felt none of those seemed like they had much promise, and I wasn't going to do it. Okay, I was going to find some other some other strategy. And 25 years later, I look back and I say, I'm glad I didn't. Okay, I don't think they made all that much progress in the last 25 years. Uh, so this is what intellectual life is. You have to place your bets on what where you think where you think there's going to be progress. This is the state of play even today, okay, in standard, in standard economics. Instead, I focused on finance, because that seemed to be where something was maybe happening.